Hello, and welcome to Baha'i Blogcast with me, your host, Rain Wilson. This is where I interview members of the Baha'i faith and other friends from all over the world about their hearts and minds and souls, their spiritual journeys, what they're interested in, and what makes them tick. Enjoy. Hello, Baha'i Blogcast. It's me, Rain Wilson, and I'm here with a dynamic, young, amazing couple that I have met in Chicago, uh, where I'm currently working. And I have the awesome Saida Segovia Taylor and the equally awesome, well, actually not quite equally awesome, <laughs> Kelsey Taylor, her husband. Uh, I'm really excited to talk to these folks. Their work is at the intersection of faith and service and diversity and dealing with issues of race and entrepreneurship in a big city and uh, really at the cutting edge. So I'm really excited to hear from them. Hi, guys. <laughs> Hi, hey. Rain. That was a great introduction. Thank you uh, so much. Okay. It's okay. It was all right. <laughs> good, good. So, um, Saida, you did a talk on Baha'i Teachings. Yes. That was really awesome about some of the work that you've been doing with Joy DeGru on healing race and uh, racism and social justice. And can you tell us a little bit about, in a nutshell, of that work that you guys did? Uh, yes. So I um, am a resident of Bronzeville. So a lot of my work involved um, working with youth and children in that area. Uh, and when doing that, you come together with, you know, the police department, the medical field, faith-based institutions, you, you, everyone wants to help the youth. And so in this particular arena with the Bronzeville Community Action Council, um, they focus on trauma and also with uh, Bright Star, they, they are trying to figure out how do we deal with the violence that's going on in Chicago. Uh, and my contribution to the table was to bring joy. I said, if we want to get to the root cause of all of this. Both kinds of joy. Literal, <laughs> literal joy <laughs> and joy to grow. Yeah. Joy to grow. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, so I said, if we want to get to the root cause of this, we need to listen to um, what Dr. DeGruy has to say. And so we pulled everyone together. We strategized um, on what can happen throughout the year, who would come to this training. And uh, she came for, for four trainings throughout last year. And we were able to get uh, approximately 1,000 people in front of her. And so with the help of many funders, including Steve Sarowitz, we were able to accomplish an amazing task. Our last podcast uh, interview, by the way. (laughs) Yes, definitely listen to that one. It was amazing. Um, But uh, so we were able to start a rippling effect of healing because what happens when uh, youth are shot or there's some kind of trauma, there's a rippling effect of trauma in the community. So the parents are affected the children are affected, and there's no entity for the for healing. And so that's what we wanted to try and do. That's, that's interesting because we hear so much about curbing the violence, and you hear like what the police departments are doing. You hear about guns. You hear about, you know, education. But you don't hear about healing the trauma. And I imagine that a lot of violence is kind of perpetrated by trauma that kids experience when they're a kid and their parents have experienced and their parents parents and and there's a lot of just unresolved emotional issues and there's not a, a chance to heal and cry and connect and and communicate about that stuff so that kind of that stuff seems kind of shoved under the rug yeah yeah and and there's so many organizations that do put things in place. So, you know, there's a a lot of environmentalists. There's a group called Environmentalists of Color where a good friend of mine um, from Sacred Keepers, she has her own organization and they focus a lot on healing, you know. So there are a lot of small groups that are doing the work that want to help on the neighborhood level, but it's a matter of connecting them so that we can start this web of support for each other because we get traumatized helping the children. We get burnt out, you know, so how do we have self-compassion for ourselves as adults and how do we support each other in this work? And so that was my personal goal was to connect everybody that was doing the work and find ways of healing together. 
That's fantastic, too, because I imagine that there are a lot of these disparate little groups, but they're not necessarily working together and, and connected and, and working in harmony. Right, right. You're a Baha'i. How yes. long have you been a Baha'i? Did you grow up a Baha'i, Baha'i family? Yes, I am second generation Baha'i. Both my parents are Baha'is, but, you know, with independent investigation of truth, it was encouraged that I look into the faith myself. And, you know, so I grew up with the principles of the Baha'i faith, but it wasn't until I became a teenager, um, probably around the age of 18, that I really dove into it myself and I started becoming active and understanding how I weave the teachings into my day-to-day life. And so that, that's when I really began my journey was my, my first year of college and I had to do a research paper on some aspect of myself. And so I, I chose the Baha'i faith because at that time I really didn't know too much about it. And so I, I, I started researching and just went into this endless well that just kept going and going and going and going. And, um, and I'm so grateful for it. So you got to be grateful too for a, a research project that almost forced you to <laughs> kind of me. dig into your Baha'i identity. I mean, what if you hadn't had that project? I know, I know. I know. Well, at the same time, I, I was also searching and trying to figure out what is life? What is my purpose? And I remember um, being at a, at a club. Uh, don't ask me how I got into this <laughs> 21 <laughs> and over <laughs> club because I was only about 17. Um, so I, I was doing things I wasn't supposed to be doing. But um, in Talk this club, I remember <laughs> dancing, you know, and it was to uh, hip hop music. And, you know, you do the two step back and forth, back and forth. And then you want to get fancy. So you do a turn and then you might you know, move your hip a little bit more, put your hand up. But then I I remember it was so clearly at this one point that I was like, is this it? Is this my life every Friday and Saturday night? And I felt like in the club, just this light came down on me and was like, okay, get your act together. Like this can't be the rest of your life. Because in my family, um, my mother's side comes from Colombia. My dad's side comes from Honduras. And they live very long lives. On my mom's side, they live to about 102 years old. And and on my dad's side, you know, my grandmother's still alive and she's, you know, in her 90s. So from 17 to 90, and is my life really going to be in the club for the rest of, you know, just doing this two steps? So I want to see I, you in the club <laughs> at, at 101. That's how I want to see you there with your walker. She could do it. She could do it. She could do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, no, that's great. So that was almost a, a kind of a mystical, profound yeah, experience. Yeah, a blessing in disguise, definitely. Yep. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And Kelsey, I don't want to leave you out of this conversation. How are you? Good. For those of you who can't see, he's, he's very dapper, dressed extremely, it's very intimidating, it's actually. Appropriately for a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, and tell us about your work as a civil engineer. So I became a... Uh, I don't know if I knew it. I didn't know it at the time, but I, I think um, I became a civil engineer when I was in Africa. Right after high school, I went to Botswana uh, in service to the Baha'i faith. I, I thought I was in service, but really the, the service was servicing me, I think, or teaching me something. But I knew I didn't want to just come out of high school and go to college and, you know, sort of take that normal track. It just didn't feel right. Um, and in Botswana, we were driving up to, you know, somewhere and I made everyone in the car stop because I saw a huge dried up riverbed Mm -hmm. and we sort of walked down into the riverbed and it just seemed so sort of out of sorts. And I just remember thinking that what, what profession is there that, you know, can help, uh, help understand or, or, or work with how water plays on the earth and, Mm. Come to find out years later that that was civil engineering, the oldest of, of engineering professions. Well, so civil engineering is like outdoor engineering. Uh, is that right? That's usually, that's pretty good. It's, it's the, really the oldest of civil engineering. It's Bridges, like the basics roads, of, of, drainage, of civilization. Yeah, irrigation. Things, sewage, how to clean water, yeah. what to do with dirty water. Uh, bro, yeah. All the water places. coming in, water coming right. out. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. So that was inspired by that by that trip. Did you grow up in a Baha'i family too? Uh, I did. My parents had also become Baha'is very shortly before. In fact, they met at a Baha'i fireside where you're learning about the Baha'i faith for the first time. 
And my dad's African-American, my mom's white, and this was like in the late 60s, and, and they met at this sort of, you know, environment where, where strange people who weren't supposed to mix were coming together talking about this yeah. sort of strange new religion, and they became Baha'is, and I was born out of that sort of, you know, that union of strangeness, you might say, or, <laughs> sort of on the cutting edge, I guess. And is Engage Civil, is that your company? You have some partners or? Yeah. So we, about four years ago, four years ago, actually, last week, uh, I walked out, five years ago last uh, last week, I walked out of the company I was at, uh, having practiced civil engineering for consulting firms for over 15 years at the time. There was something that was always missing. Mm. Um sort of the connection to why we do it. I think it's the quickest way to explain it. Yeah. We would start project meetings and for the first time on a project you were going to work on for years and nobody would introduce each other. Or uh, I would start at a new company and they would just say, okay, here's a project you're going to be working on. And it, it, I, it took a long time before I was able to understand what was missing and was that why are we doing this? Mm. What is our greater purpose here? This is what we're doing, but there's got to be a why. And what is the why and the greater purpose for something like civil engineering? It's a great question. So we've actually put that in the tagline of our company, and that's engaged engineering for an ever-advancing civilization. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, so that that's sort of a reminder to myself and our employees, current and future, that there is a purpose, and that purpose is in service to humanity. Wow. So if you get a job and um, someone's opening an office building and they want the civil engineering, they want the drainage and the water and the sidewalks and the roads and the parking structures and everything like that. That's pretty good. Um, you did your homework. I did a little bit, yeah. yes. Um, how are you helping an ever advancing civilization through that? So my first project, and when I say mine, it was just me at the time, uh, was for a library in a depressed community. So you get to see that you're providing something that's needed. And, yeah. and you, you watch what happens in that space and how the people interact there and how they need it and how they perceive it. And and I think that's important to try to remind you back to your purpose. You're serving this. You're not the critical key element. You can't do it alone. But you're part of the, the team that's serving this this purpose. And then, you know, after that, we've done a church that was expanding, a very mm-hmm. vibrant church on the on the West Loop, and then you know, working now on a, re- rehabilitating the Cook County Hospital, which was the first. Uh, it's one of the few hospitals at the time that would serve uh, African Americans, and my wow. aunt my aunt was born there. She, so she recently passed, and I found out that she was born at this hospital. And this hospital, this building has been sitting vacant for over 10 years. Hmm. And it's being repurposed into a hotel and commercial. And the, the, it, that legacy sort of gets to um, have a new life mm-hmm. in that it's becoming something new. But it should be honored in, in a sense because it, it was serving uh, people who wouldn't couldn't be served elsewhere at that time. So those kinds of things remind us, you, you know, sort of uh, there's a greater purpose. And, Oh, that's that's beautiful. I'm I'm always reminded of that when I go to the Baha'i Holy Land, and it's very uplifting for my soul and for my eyes to see this these incredible edifices that are done. Everything is done with such care and such purpose. Mm-hmm. Even how the you know the lighting is done and the electrics and the and the drainage and the and the, certainly the gardens and uh, it's 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 wonderful to see the. Uh, the Baha'i spirit and the, the spirit of, of Shoghi Effendi's kind of effectiveness and keen eye and aesthetic vision kind of put to use uh, in so many different ways. Like it's just, it's just a pleasure to be in that environment. Yeah. And it's funny you mentioned it because I, uh, actually I, I was named after Curtis Kelsey, who was uh, an electrician instrumental in, putting the first lighting plant at the Shrine of the Bob back uh, during the time of Shoghi Effendi. So um, I, I guess the, that sort of legacy was a predictor of maybe. Oh, wow. You know, so you're, you're kind of, a, you're a namesake in, in several different ways. Trying. Being an engineer yeah. as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've read some stories about him. He's a 
crazy big personality kind mm. of what is from like Idaho or some crazy some, place and, <laughs> like that, and yeah. ended up uh, with Shogi Effendi and yeah. um, uh, putting the electrics in there. That's, that's really cool. So what Saida, we were talking earlier um, about justice and um, in the work you do now and fill us in too. You, you did that work with Joy DeGru and now you're working for the uh, Chicago public schools. What's your, um, What's your role there now? So now I'm the family and community engagement manager for Network 6. So the city, Chicago, is split up into 13 different networks, which are sections of the city. Um, And each network has a team that really gets hands-on with the schools in that network. Um, And so on the team, you know, there are people that work with a curriculum development, social emotional learning, you know, everything that needs to encompass a school um, and for it to thrive. Uh, one of them, one of the components is uh, family and community engagement. And I've been doing this type of work for about, I'd, I'd say all my life. I want to know how can I help, you know, who knows what, and then connect everybody so that this thing can actually happen. And so when this position opened, it was right around the time where I completed the year-long initiative with Dr. DeGru and the Bronzeville Partners, um, and it was a perfect match. Um, I do have a background in education. I was a physical education teacher. Uh, I also taught health and You're dance. You were a PE teacher? I was a PE teacher. That's hysterical. <laughs> yeah, and it was probably You know the Woody the Allen things. quote, those who can't no. teach and those who can't teach teach gym. Oh, oh no. <laughs> that was not the case with me. Mine was about health and nutrition and, um, you know, and, and social emotional learning. I tied everything that I knew. Did you teach I, badminton? That's no, all I want to know. No, know. and I actually took out, um, oh, what it, dodgeball. So the kids were really mad about that because I was all about team building, you yeah. know, virtues. My purpose of being a gym teacher was to help the the students be healthy, nutritious, work together. Um, Building teams. Exactly. I had a lot of team building activities um, and for them to be virtuous. So I had this chart at the end of the week and we would all, you know, vote on like, you know, were they helpful? Were they kind? Could they uh, be forgiving with each other? You know, so I instilled the virtues and and, um, that's so important. Yeah. You know, my son has done various sports over the years. He's not a terribly athletic kid, but he's done some basketball and some soccer and some baseball. And it, it's amazing that in this day and age, the lack of focus on team and team building yeah. and sports, it's all about winning. It's all and winning. it's about pinpointing those two to three to four hot shot jocks that are on your team and getting them the ball so they can score right. and everyone else in their place. And uh, it, it, it's it's so unevolved right. the world of sports, and he's left a number of teams just because of they're just like you know on a basketball team, and there's one kid who's insanely good, right? Mm-hmm. And that, that's great, good for that kid, but and he should be getting the ball a lot, no question. But it's just like throw him the ball, throw him right. the ball, and they're not they're not sharing, they're not learning how to spread it around, they're not learning how to to work together as a team. Yeah, and it's because the focus is off, right? So you'll see that kind of mentality in every arena that you're in. There's a star player, whether you're on the band or medical field or science field, and then we do these highlights of these people um, instead of like bringing everyone along and teaching everybody to work together. And how do we encourage the gifts that's within everyone? Uh, you know, there's the quote that that talks about, you know, man is a mind full of gems of inestimable um, value. Right. You know, so how are we polishing those gems? How are we uncovering? How are we, you know, bringing them out in each other? And so you have to create scenarios wherever you're at so that everyone can be a part of the conversation. But this is, you know, what what you guys are both bringing up is something I think about a lot is that in every field out there. The world is longing for the message of Baha'u'llah and not just literally the message of like, I'm the promised one and you should be a Baha'i, not that message, but the underlying spiritual philosophy. Everything needs to be reinvented, whether it's civil engineering, whether it's a gym class, you know, whether it's show business, how people work together, certainly engaging in, in race and social justice and the trauma around that and, and community involvement. 
which in some ways might be even more advanced because people are at least struggling for for peace and working together for peace but it, it doesn't it almost doesn't matter your field thing everything needs to be reinvented like you yeah. said Kelsey like why are we mm. here why are we doing this yeah. why are we purpose? doing this engineering for this uh, for this library or this hospital and yeah. uh, who are we as a team um, it's getting to the just the common basic kind of spiritual humanity of people working together and creating unity yeah and I actually think if we once we answer that question better in all these arenas they all perform better even business mm. I, I often think that if we were sit, would sit in this room and have the Baha'i consultation that things would flow much better and this would be a much more successful and profitable project. But, you know, that's so difficult to implement in a room that's focused more maybe on hierarchy. Yeah. You know, and so just yeah, in, in, in Hollywood, it's very hierarchy. So everyone in the, all the executives in the room look to the top executive yeah. and they're, and that top executive isn't even the top, top executive. And so this guessing game of like, what does the top executive <laughs> want? Yeah. You know, what's the mandate? Mm-hmm. And people just don't speak out of turn. And it's, it's, it's the least collaborative place uh, possible. And, you know, making of art like that should be, should be collaborative. Right. Yeah. And the culture of fear is what is instilled everywhere. Right. So we have to move away from that. You know, this bully mentality, you know, that's one of the main problems that I hear uh, across the school system, you know, they're, they're bullies. But if we look at like how things are conducted, there's always one person that says how things go and it should go like that. And then everyone else is scared to fall out of line. And so then we conform ourselves to figure out how to meet that mandate instead of, you know, contributing. And, and, and so, yeah, we all lose at the end of the day. Yeah. We, I had asked before, uh, you were talking about, about justice, and yet that hidden word about justice and, and the work that you try and pursue justice on a daily basis in your job. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So just on a day to day basis, the way I see people interacting with each other, whether it's the principal and a, a parent or a parent and a student or a teacher and a student or, you know, just parent with parent you know, if it's a white parent and a black parent, you know, so I'm always looking through the lens of justice, even the way we treat the earth around us, you know, um, are, are we helping each other thrive? Are we bringing the best version of ourselves out? Are we helping the other person be the best version of themselves? Um, are we helping the plants around us? You know, uh, it, it, everyone makes fun of me because I'm into plants now and I'm always giving away plants and I'm nurturing the plants. <laughs> you didn't bring me a plant. <laughs> You did bring me a delicious kombucha that I'm enjoying right now. So yes, thank you for that. It's good for your digestive system. So I'm always thinking about like how how can we make this situation that we have with us at this moment in time while we're together the best opportunity and the best experience that we can have together. Are we going to leave each other upset? Or are we going to leave each other with ideas and creativity and being able to implement new ways of being um, so that I always have that in my mind? You know, was I just with you? Were you just with the next person? Um, and I can always kind of tolerate when people are, you know, mean to me and, you know, I, I, I can be forgiving, but I cannot be forgiving when I see somebody hurting somebody else. That's when I feel like I have to step in. You know, and, and Kelsey reminded me of a story. Um, I was walking across Monroe, I think it was, no, Michigan Avenue. And it's very busy on Michigan Avenue, and there's a horrible light system on Monroe. And my grandparents and a whole bunch of elderly uh, people were trying to cross the street. And this crossing guard wasn't helping at all. And so, you know, one light passes, another light passes, and cars just keep going and they keep making a right turn. So we stood there for three lights. And my grandmother is tired. You know, we were trying to get to the next destination. Four lanes of traffic and a boulevard. So it takes a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I was, I kept trying to signal the crossing guard and she's talking on her phone, you know, not doing what she was supposed to. 
So I went out into the middle of the street and stopped the cars myself, you know, and I was like, this, like, this needs to stop. And so, you know, I, I told all the elderly people to, you know, start crossing <laughs> oh, the street and I'm, you know, the cars are honking at me and, you, you were know, like but Moses. I was just <laughs> <laughs> leading them to the promised land across Monroe. Yeah. yeah. But, but it's those things, you know, and so the crossing guard, of course, starts yelling at me and I'm like, you know, you're not doing what you were supposed to. So mm -hmm. I needed to step in because these people are tired. They're trying to get to their place. And so, you know, it, it's small things like that on a daily basis. And, you know, it's it's sometimes exhausting for the people that are with me. They're like, oh, gosh, there she goes again. Oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. You know, we were in mm -hmm. Disney World and my mom's like, please, mm -hmm. God, no, just <laughs> we're in Disney World. It's like, let people be. But <laughs> if I, you know, if, if people aren't treating each other kindly, that's a trigger in me. And um, from the smallest thing to the largest thing. So if I see a policy that is unjust, you know, I will mobilize people to try and figure out how to advocate for a different policy or changes in that policy. If there's something that's happening in the community, I will work with the community members to figure out how do we change this. And then if it's on, you know, a, a married couple that's having trouble communicating, I try to give tools for, for them to get through that time period in their life. And so um, it's just in me. It's, it's in me. And I feel that that's my purpose. So whatever arena or role or career choice I make, this is always going to come through me. And that's what I feel comes from the Baha'i faith. You know, my favorite quote from Baha'u'llah uh, is a hidden word, uh, O son of spirit, the best beloved of all things in my sight is justice. Turn not away therefrom if thou desirest me, and neglect it not that I may confide in thee. By its aid thou shalt see with thine own eyes, and not through the eyes of others, and shalt know of thine own knowledge, and not through the knowledge of thy neighbor. Ponder this in thy heart, how it behooveth thee to be. Verily justice is my gift to thee, and the sign of my loving kindness. Set it then before thine eyes. So that's how I see everything. You know, uh, I cannot turn away from a situation that is unjust because I feel like God is always looking at me and is always testing me. Saida, are you going to do the right thing? Are you going to stand up for the person that is being hurt right now? And so that's how I see the world on a daily basis. That's that's really beautiful. And, you know, it's interesting. I, I'm I'm no Baha'i scholar, and but I did get in a discussion once with Stephen Phelps about this word justice. And there's two words for, for justice, I think, in, in Arabic. For instance, the universal house of justice is one word that, that literally means justice the way we think of it, of like meeting out punishment, justice, you know, a gavel, laws, kind of. And the other word justice that is translated as justice in the hidden words by Shoghi Effendi also means in the Arabic fair-mindedness. Mm. And, I, and I love that because it's that, that intersection between fair-mindedness, like you and those old people at the, with the crossing <laughs> guard, and justice. It's that, that intersection between the laws and like what's right. Mm -hmm. And we have to see what's right and yes. see it through our own eyes yeah. uh, and not through the eyes of others. And that's part of an individual investigation of truth and uh, it, it's such a great it's such a great challenge. And one thing I really admire about you guys is you walk the walk, you know, both of you. And you're trying, uh, you're, you're, you're trying. And uh, I do want to get to your marriage uh, here in a little bit and that story. But I know that both of you are also very involved in um, in work with youth. And Kelsey, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the Gap Project and also diversity uh, is super important to you guys. So I'd love to to hear a little bit about your your thoughts and your work around those those things. Mm -hmm. Gap Project. So the, the Gap Project is, uh, the Gap is a neighborhood in, inside of Bronzeville, uh, which is on the south side of Chicago. And it's went on for maybe 10, 15 years in that neighborhood. Small project, but based out of the Chicago Baha'i Center, which was located there. And um, I got, the call came out from, from another young Baha'i lady that there was, she, she had sort of ended up in the middle of this program, which was 10, 15 
boys mostly, all boys at that time. And she was like, it's just me. She was a Persian, 20, 18, 19 year old Persian who lived in a high rise in downtown Chicago. And she was on the South side with these boys. So I, I had been hearing these stories from my father, who was a high school teacher for every night, every night for a decade about teaching. And he always liked to teach uh, black youth, especially ones who were in rough situations. In fact, the program he was in in high school was called AAA, and that, that was attendance, attitude, and academic. And that was problems, not, not good. These were people who had problems in those three areas. Every night at dinner, he was telling us these stories about being in the classroom, and we need more black teachers, and we need, he wanted me to be a teacher. But I don't think he realized that he was also talking me out of it at the same time, <laughs> telling those stories. I'm like, you want me to do that? But I felt like I was also at his at a student in his classroom and learning sort of teaching and so so when this call came out for people to work with this project I, I, I was drawn towards it and uh, you know I I ended up learning more about myself with kids because kids who who are in rough situations they're growing up without parental structure without a tight family they're strong and they know how to call you out and that's what I found out first of all is that Man, I'm getting called out. Why is this kid <laughs> making me cry? Like I'm, I'm not. Mm-hmm. You know, this, these are rough kids, and I had to grow up, and they were challenging me, and I would leave thinking, why am I so sort of challenged by this kid? You know, what's going on here? And I, I'm really grateful for having been in those situations. Um, what did and, you learn going through that? Man, that I that that strength comes from from difficulty, I think, mm. and so you know, we judge people, right? People judge people and we don't judge them through the proper lens a lot of times. And we, we you know, we, we work with what we have. And the truth is that I was growing up uh, in, in, the, in the North Shore and a relatively sheltered, even with all of the things that I heard and, and was, a, a, you know, African-American and, you know, my parents are mm-hmm. sort of radical and revolutionary. So all these conversations and my family and friends are all, all black, but, but being in, economically challenged areas um, that was a little bit foreign to me. So I just learned that, that there, there is strength. There's a strength and, and um, an awareness that comes from uh, those kids. You know, one of the fun things about working with kids, and we've worked with kids, so we've worked with kids, all, kids are kids, right? Kids all over the world of different types. And the kids who need the most, they need who are getting the least need the most from you. And those are the funnest, most rewarding kids to be with. I mean, you can, I think we've tried different projects and events with kids who don't have this sort of family structure deficit thing. And it's just not fun. They don't need you. They got their, they got their own, you know, they could care less if you're there. Mm-hmm. But kids who, who, who need you, they bond with you. And that's a chance to, you have to, think about uh it forces it forced me to think about things to think about myself to think about i had to grow up i had to grow up when these kids are in front of you and they're fighting about something silly like shoes or i remember there was this one kid calvin and it was his cousin i think a girl and the the girl had thrown an ice cube like across the building and hit him in the head and he was bleeding. And when you're 19 or 20, you're not necessarily thinking about how to deal with these kinds of situations and why they were fighting. And, and so you have to think, of, it comes to find out that you know none of these kids would eat breakfast in the morning, that they would be up all night watching TV. And so you have to think about how to feed a, a kid and how, why are they unhappy? Just all kinds of things that at 19 or 20, you're typically not thinking about because we're, we're sort of in a selfish phase of life. So I, mm. I really appreciate mm. that, that mm. you know, having mm. to grow up a little bit because it wasn't long after that we had our own daughter. You know, so I, I feel like that prepared a little mm. head start. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. And what about the diversity work that both of you guys do? So in for the past 20 years, I've been working in black and Latino neighborhoods, um, trying to figure out how to connect them to the resources that they need. Uh, And so 
it, that that's that's always been my my passion and for me it's just helping people um of where i live uh you know people that i went to school with not knowing that this was an actual career path and so when i became older i went back to school and i got my um masters in community development and social justice uh so no longer a physical education teacher <laughs> and i'm more about you know the community in a holistic way and so that's always the thing you know race and equity and the the legacy of this country and how it was built and how our institutions are still stained with the legacy of slavery and how policies were made and you know so i'm always looking at how can we diversify these different fields because it's not it's it's when the medical field and the STEM field and, you know, all these uh, law, everything, when that becomes diversified, then that's when we can have true answers of how we can move forward as a society. Right now, it's mainly at the top of each arena is white men. And they're driving the decisions. They're making the decisions. Um, and so how... They're having the podcast. They're, they're having the, <laughs> the no, podcast. No offense, no offense. <laughs> None taken. <laughs> they have the power. So how do we create a new system that helps diversify uh, the people that are making the power? Um, and then what are those barriers? And so I, had, I, I was a part of this project that looked at how do you diversify STEM fields. And um, my friend Amaris, she's amazing. Um, she worked for the Chicago Botanic Gardens and together, you know, brought a whole bunch of groups together, a lot of out of school time STEM organizations. And at the end of that year long project, we looked at three R's, which are recruitment, retention, and release. Uh, so those three categories, how are we looking at those things that include people of color? So when you're trying to recruit people for your organization, whether it be your school or university or a uh, job, how are you recruiting them? Are you using flyers that look like the people that you want? Are you using the language or the terminology that's familiar to them? So, so, so you, what is your recruitment strategy? What is your retain, your, how do you retain them? So now once you have them in the room, do you have foods, colors, scents, smells that are familiar to the people make that are- Make them feel are, at home. Make, make them, them feel, feel at home, mm -hmm. exactly. Like, you know, if you had empanadas here, maybe, you know, I would feel like- <laughs> Like I was more at home. But Instead, just, I have cheese whip and triscuits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But things that are familiar to us, you know, so are we providing a culture that welcomes diversity? Uh, and then when we're releasing them from one environment to another, the people that we're kind of handing them off to, so if you're transitioning from eighth grade to high school or high school to college, you know, the people that you're releasing them to, are they culturally aware, right. you know? And so are you having conversations with them and saying, you know, this is what made them comfortable in my environment. This is how you can continue their development, you know? So what adjustments do we need to make to include everyone? And so, you know, to make those decisions, you need everyone to help make those decisions. Yeah. And Kelsey, you're doing that in your in your work too, right? You you take in young people, um, and it's very rare to have African Americans in the engineering fields, and uh, and mentoring some folks and stuff like that. You know what? There was no no engineers in my family. I I didn't even know what an engineer was, um, and nobody uh, was in business. So when you enter the, the engineering world, that's one thing. You go to school and that's one thing, right? There may be a few other people and there's some diversity in school. But when you get out of school, that's a whole different experience of non-diversity. And to sit in these rooms time after time, and it's still kind of jarring to me, especially in this day and age, when I enter a room and there could be 15, 30 people around the table and all but five of them are, are white men and, and it's and, and then even then there's a culture there's a very defined culture of among all, among all of those people and it's a deficit it's to their deficit to the deficit of the team to not have diversity and I could go into an entire different podcast you have me on for next episode about <laughs> what those deficits are um, so well, why did you hit some I'd love to hear well uh, 
look, the first of all, the hierarchy. You know, we, we touched on that before. If if the hierarchy is the highest uh, sort of uh, importance in the room, that no matter what, we have to preserve that hierarchy, then people, and, and if the guy at the top is good with that, he's he's comfortable with his hierarchy because he's at the top and he's got to maintain this, I'm in charge. And those subtleties uh, control the conversation and the strings of, of the free flow of information, then people learn to be quiet because they've, they're, they're getting the message that if I speak up, that I'm going to be stepping outside of the hierarchy and that's not gonna be good for my career. When that happens, everyone's quiet, you're on an engineering project, then that information can deprive the project yeah. of excellence. Yeah. And it's happened, right? This is the space shuttle, uh, 1985 Columbia, mm -hmm. I might be getting that wrong, mm -hmm. yeah. but that's one of the most famous examples of the free flow of information being sort of shunted. And other cultures don't have that limitation. Mm. You know, the other cultures will have the relationship at the top of the, you know, I think women especially, uh, the, the, the lack of, of the voice of women in the, in the room is probably even more detrimental than, than the minority participation, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so the fact that I have this experience in 20 years of, of being in these rooms allows me to speak to young people, college and high school students, in, in a way that, that sort of answers the questions that they don't even know they have yet. And I can explain to them, you're gonna be sitting in rooms where you're gonna be the only person and you have to sort of uh, ex you, you just watch the room, how it operates <laughs> and be comfortable with the fact that you may not perceive this situation the same way as everyone else. And over time, you'll be able to find your voice in that. So to, to speak to people like that, mm. you know, is is helpful. And I never had anyone to sort of have that conversation with me in any way. I had to learn it. And that's fine. It's been good for me. But there, there are other people now who don't have to give them a little head start, right? Well, that's great. That's great to give the young people preparation and help them find find their voice. Mm. Uh, it's, it's crucial. Let's switch gears here a little bit. And... Um, how did you guys meet? Let's move into the marriage field. So the marriage field. So I, in my rebellious now that we, stage. Uh, <laughs> now that we solved all the well, race well, and well, racial well, justice and, well, and diversity issues, uh, let's move on. Go ahead, <laughs> Saida, sorry, fun. I interrupted. No, no, no. So in my rebellious stage of when I was going to the club, um, <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> and searching uh, for my purpose, at that same time, my parents, um, you know, were begging me to go to Baha'i functions, you know, because as a teenager, you just don't want to do what your parents have been wanting you to do um, from little. This is when you're trying to find yourself and your independence. And so this one particular time they said, please just come with us to this fireside. You know, some friends of ours are going to be there. It'd be nice for all, all, all of us to be together as a family. And so we went and um, and little did I know that there were Baha'is that were my age and acted exactly like me and were into the arts. And so when I went to this fireside, um, the Baha'i Youth Workshop was in the basement, had just come back from uh, New York. And um, they were telling me about all the performances. That's the dancers, Baha'i Youth Workshop? Yeah, that so the Baha'i, yeah. yeah. So it was a performing group that promoted the principles of the Baha'i faith uh, through dancing, singing, um, mm -hmm. rap. And uh, and I went to a performing arts high school, Lincoln Park here in, uh, in Chicago. Um, so I'm, I was used to being around artists. That was my world, you know, always performing or collaborating with other artists. So when I saw the Chicago Baha'i Youth Workshop, I said, oh, wow, not only are they artists, but they're deepened artists. Like they are trying to do something positive with their craft. Uh, and Kelsey was the DJ of that group. Um, nice. And as soon as I saw him, um, I was attracted right away. Um, and so I started going to workshops. Women dig DJs, you know? <laughs> Spiritual so I, DJs, especially. So I started going to the rehearsals so I could be around Kelsey and get to know him. Um, and uh, that's when I started digging deeper and deeper. See, it's not always about the spiritual, man. Whatever work, whatever work. Yeah, whatever whatever, whatever gets you in the door, yeah. <laughs> 
Um, you know, so that coupled with the research paper around that same time, mm -hmm. you know, it was like just it, 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 all these entry points for me just happened to push me in and, and be active and, and find my true purpose. And so um, that's how we met. Uh, I had to remind Kelsey that he met me that day. You know, he was playing hard to get. So I had to <laughs> figure think. out and one, how one to thing get that his struck attention. me about, about Sida was that the, the, the second time I met her, I, I, I think I couldn't remember her name or something, or I, I don't know. I won't. But she said, you remember me. <laughs> and it was almost like, okay, I do, I guess I do. It, it's just so forward. It was unusual that that uh, because you grew up, grew up in Glen yeah, Club, well, you know, the girls don't do that in the suburbs <laughs> in the same way. So here's this girl commanding me that I remembered her, and she was right. <laughs> Great. And we were speaking before about uh, you guys, your marriage. I'd, I'd love to hear maybe a little more about your your courtship and you know forming a Baha'i marriage union, and. Um, but then some of the struggles that you guys have had and how you share your experiences with young couples. Well, I think here's, an, here's another one. When, when, when you get married, you don't know what you don't know. And we like to, to share this with people now, especially people who are getting married. That is difficult. And I don't know that anybody to, told us that. I don't remember hearing that that it's going to be difficult and that's okay, that that's part of it. And so when it gets really difficult, which it does, um, you know, for us it was sort of four, seven, and what these years that people say, you, there's sort of these milestones that are, you know, predicted data points that, that you're gonna have troubles in. For us it was like four, seven, 15, whatever. And when, so when you get to it and nobody's told you that you're gonna have trouble, when the trouble comes, you start thinking, did I make a mistake? Did I pick the wrong person? Or is there something wrong with me? Something that, wrong with me, yeah. yeah. And that just cascades, makes it even worse. And you think that there's nothing you can do. You're, not, you're disempowered because you're sort of a victim of the situation or something, I don't know. And um, so that, that was a struggle. We, after the, the first time, we got separated once for a little bit. And then fast forward to the second one, we still didn't get it right. And then we come with these models too, I think, especially for, you know, my, yeah. my parents did all they could, your parents did all they could to give us a good structure, but we have to pick up the sort of the threads of the Baha'i faith and weave the, it was our job to sort of grow the structures that our parents gave us. And Yeah, and, uh, yeah cause both, both our parents entered the Baha'i faith in their 20s you know so they they came to the faith with a lot of um the way the the world lives you know so implementing the principles took a took a while and so you know kelsey and i were still trying to figure out how do you implement it and and in the baha'i faith um marriage is described as a fortress for well-being you know and and if you marry a baha'i you know then you can serve together you know and there's this beautiful uh image of what marriage should be however it's new <laughs> and so how do you get to that fortress of well-being when you're trying to figure out who you are you're trying to figure out this other person then you throw kids into the mix and then everyone's in survival mode trying to get some sleep trying to figure things out and your interpretation of what the baby wants when it's crying is different you know so my way of nurturing my child when she's suffering is you hold her you feed her you you figure out what is going on where kelsey's Wait, model me, was Kelsey, yeah the baby's got to cry you got to be strong <laughs> that that's how they learn to grow to be strong you leave them to cry and that that's a model we still see that at christmas with mm. the, the families with the young kids we see that my family is let the baby cry, and then you go to her family, and there's a hundred people holding the baby at the same time. So yeah, so they're very different models, and you don't know what your model is until you enter that that scenario. And then when you're challenged with a different model, and you don't have the communication skills to get through and be solution oriented, then that's where chaos just breaks loose. And that's where I see a lot of the breakdown um, in, in a lot of marriages is that we don't have the proper tools to work through the problems. And so then we tend to avoid it. And with that avoidance comes the danger of not fixing it. Uh, and so through the two times that we 
separated. So in the Baha'i faith, um, if you want to get a divorce, you must go through the seer of patience. Um, and we went on that twice. Uh, and each time um, you're supposed to go through this, you know, period of really investigating what happened in the marriage. You know, where was this breakdown? You know, we, we lived apart. We went to therapy. It was excruciatingly hard, I know, at least for me, um, because you feel like you made a mistake. You feel like there was just this. And don't you find that it's interesting? There seems to be a bias in the Baha'i faith, maybe less these days, but among many Baha'is that I speak to, a bias against therapy. Um, even though it's really recommended in the writings and speaking to doctors and professionals and whatnot, and, and the House of Justice writes letters, you know, suggesting people get right. therapy. But I think so many Baha'is believe like, well, all the answers should be in the writings. Yeah. Like right. you should just pray and read the hidden words together. <laughs> yeah, and then you, you don't need to like, right. you know, and it should all just be solved. Yeah. yeah. And that, that's one of the great things we had to learn. So I, I be, I, like the, when Saida moved out the, the last time we went a year of patients, she moved out. She told me and everyone and their mama she was done. Done. She even says it like this: "I'm done." <laughs> yeah. And I can her our neighbor helped move the furniture out. Right? It was just, yeah. just so painful. And something a voice told me is like, "Well, she said she's done," and told everyone she's done. But the Baha'u'llah calls this a year of patience, and that's a year. And so many nights I'd be sitting at home and thinking it's seven months and it's only getting worse. And I said, well, seven months is not a year. So it was this law that, that Baha'u'llah put in place, the year of patience, it's called a year for a reason. So that was sort of my commitment to stick to it, even though I didn't understand it. What are we told to do in a year of patience, like specifically? So from my understanding is that you, you're specifically, you're supposed to live apart. Um, and you're supposed to help repair or understand what happened. But don't a lot of Baha'is only start a year of patience when they know that they are done and then right, they kind yeah. of don't do the work in that year? They've kind of like whatever they've been through in the preceding time, they've, they're, they're, they're split. And so they're just right. kind of waiting, licking I, their wounds, waiting until they can sign their exactly. divorce papers. Exactly. And, and I think we, we need to learn how to utilize that because there's a lot of wisdom in, in the year of patience. And so, yeah, I did get, we did get to that breaking point of like, I want a divorce and now we have to do the year of patience. We have to just wait it out and then it'll be done. You know, and, and when I moved out, I, I remember I was done. Done. And um, and and I started Done. I started <laughs> investigating other people's character, you know, and and seeing, you know, can I date now? You know, I'm out of the house. I'm no more with this man, and um, and I wasn't utilizing the year of patience the way I was supposed to. And so for seven months, you know, I was just angry. I was so angry, and uh, and hurt and empty. I felt like. I was so alone, you know, during the time of trying to repair while I was in the house. Um, and so you're just running on empty. And so when you leave, and I've seen this time and time again, you try to search and fulfill that emptiness with the next person that walks in front of you or, you know, whatever food you're eating. You know, you just get into these bad habits um, and you're not looking within trying to figure out what happened. And so I, I, I know there's wisdom in the year because that gives you enough time so what to come around. So what and, happened between month seven and month 12? So month seven and month 12, I noticed that a lot of the patterns that I had were my patterns, then they weren't Kelsey's patterns. They were, they weren't the other people's patterns. How did you arrive at my, that? That takes a lot of wisdom to When you just see, see month that after month, this, the same things happening, you know, like I, I, I would meet someone and we'd have the same conversation. And then in our conversation, there just took that turn of the communicate. I'm not being heard. He's not hearing me. It's this isn't happening. And so you just see your patterns over and over and over again. And it was like Baha'u'llah was like, huh, you want to try this? Bam, you know. And so so I got to this point of just like enough already. This is the man that I chose to marry. A year of patience is almost up. We have a child together. We have to be in each other's lives forever. If I'm going to go through this trouble 
of figuring out who I am and how to work with another person, it should be Kelsey because that's who I made the commitment to. That's what you know. And so if we are going to get a divorce, I'm going to use these last few months to figure out how to be at peace with Kelsey and figure out how I can get these um, destructive patterns out of my own life. Because if I am, if we are going to get a divorce and I'm going to be on my own, how am I going to be a healthy individual? Or if we're going to be together, how can I be a healthy individual within the marriage? And so, so those last few months is what I dedicated to myself of a lot of reflection on me and how I can be a better person. It was no longer about Kelsey's, um, you know, uh, deficits or how Kelsey made me upset or how Kelsey can change and how Kelsey. It now became about me and what I'm supposed to be doing in the in in the eyes of God. Okay, and meanwhile, I had to do some stuff too. Uh, and for me, my journey was a little bit different, but the pain was just excruciating, right? I think because it, like, she's moved out again, really, after all of this work I thought I had been doing and this failure. And I think it took that crushing moment, right? One of my favorite quotes during that time was about the the fire of test. It, it is uh, the through the fire of test that the 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 dross is the the pure gold shining forth, right? That that this notion that you're going through a test is good, and I, I remember thinking that I'm going through a test, I'm going through a test, and that pain broke me down to a place where I was open to things that I wasn't uh, open to before, and I think that's what prayer does. I, I didn't. I, I'm with you that. Baha'is oftentimes close the door to other sort of knowledge sets. When Baha'u'llah didn't come here to build the details of a new civilization, he gave us the foundation. He gave us an outline of what's so that, to happen. So that means that it was up to someone else to build the, the, the details of it, the structure of it uh, very often. And in marriage is one of those details. There's some fantastic pro-marriage counselors out there that are non Traditional. I don't know that traditional marriage counseling is the right way for everybody, because oftentimes those counselors will tell you too soon that you know you guys maybe it's just time you you go a different way. But there are some counselors. right. They will not necessarily have the spiritual foundation to know that uh, yeah. marriage is a fortress for well-being, that you're on a spiritual journey through all the worlds of God, right. and that you know the importance of giving it absolutely everything you can. They might they might just say well maybe you should just get a divorce here yeah. you guys yeah. are really not communicating too well together or something yeah. it's important to find a counselor that shares the values or that you share with them the writings of the face so they're they're, they're on the same they're on the same page with you yeah that as a foundation is critical and it turns out there's a lot of very practical sort of uh, knowledge there's people who study like data almost like engineers who study the, mm -hmm. the marriages, mm -hmm. how they work. For instance, uh, Dr. Harley is one of my favorite. He mm -hmm. and his wife, they're actually conservative Christians, but he was a practicing uh, counselor, therapist, and he sort of came to this revelation that, that my therapy isn't producing any better results than people who don't go through therapy. Mm. So he sort of backed in and he created this model called the Love Bank. And I like that as an engineer because it was very practical, it was sort of this notion that you can do certain things that will fill up the love bank. And in fact, when we go through the exercise, we're like, wow, yes, I, I was working hard to stay in that marriage, but I was doing all of the things that I wanted and the exact opposite of the things that would fill her love bank. So you were, you were making withdrawals exactly. from the love bank. <laughs> and got right. real negative. <laughs> and that was another thing that sort of hit me during this year of patience. I'm like, wow, if someone can describe our mar the, this situation as if they were in our marriage, then maybe it's more common than I thought. And therefore, that gave me sort of a path of hope yeah. that, I was, that if, if, you, if someone can describe your problem and they can tell you there's a solution, that maybe those solution will work. And so about that same time, I was committed to changing many of the behaviors that I was going through one very practical behavior and this came from another woman who i can't think of the name right now but fantastic book uh called divorce busting 
uh, she said there's this 180 technique and guys need to know this. If, you're, if your woman has walked out on you, you need to know this 180 technique. Stop chasing her because it's, she's gone, right? And, and focus on yourself. And that was one that when I implemented it, and you can't do it because when your wife's leaving you, that's the, you want to go reach out to her. You want to send her flowers and do it, but she's done and it, it would anger her. That's what the book described. And I would do those things. Sure enough, it was exactly the same, the outcome that she predicted. So then I would like an engineer, I say, okay, well, let me do what she says will work. Focus on yourself, do 180, walk away. And when I did that, Sida would actually start to pay more attention to me. And uh, those kinds of little things I felt came about because of prayer and because of being open and wanting to do all that could within the structure of a year of patience. Wow, that's that's really beautiful. That's great. I one thing that you know, marriage is is the hardest. It's the hardest thing uh, mm -hmm. ever in mm -hmm. one's life. And um, uh, my wife and I have been through a lot. And uh, you know, one of the things that I've had to learn too, and I think it's it's partially a male thing. It's partially a white male thing of like when my wife is in pain or struggling, like my impulse is to fix it, correct it, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, make something happen, try and diagnose mm -hmm. where the root issue is. Mm -hmm. And when really my job is to bring as much empathy and compassion to the situation as possible. And that means mm -hmm. shutting up and just listening mm -hmm. and being there and being present. and. It's terrifically hard for me. I mean, I've had to almost learn it artificially, kind of in my head, go, shut up, just brain, yeah. don't talk, yeah. don't try and <laughs> fix anything. <laughs> try and just try and listen and, and be kind, just open your heart. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, they don't, it would be so helpful to um, uh, have more Baha'i marriage materials, you know, um, yeah. about practical tools practical. for preserving yes. a marriage or how a year of patience works and mm -hmm. you know a, a study guide for assemblies because mm -hmm. they uh, here you have these assemblies all over and the assemblies are not you know you've got a a, a doctor and a lawyer and a car mechanic and a housewife <laughs> and they're like all of a sudden the ones counseling these right. uh baha'i couples that are in trouble or yeah. um in a year of patience they don't have the the tools or the framework to to deal with them that yeah. so Right. My charge to you is to, <laughs> among, as if you're not busy enough already, to <laughs> help. Uh, hey, help we thought about budget. it. We definitely thought we, about we it. We thought right? about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, because there are so many different types of therapy that we went to. There are all these workbooks and, and books that we went through that, you know, we can kind of piece together um, what's in line with the faith and what helps. Um, you know, another favorite uh, therapy thing that we went to was imago therapy and yeah. that suggests that you know we we both come to the relationship with issues that have not been dealt with or matured with our own parents and sure. our own families yeah. and so now you know everything and your own traumas and, and our in our own traumas and so what does that look like you know and we can't even identify it ourselves but what we tend to do is now blame the other person for continuing to like, hurt for instance me. i don't you know. i don't want to diagnose you but <laughs> If you're if you felt growing up that your family never listened to you exactly. and you have a trauma around not being heard right. and then you're in a marriage and you yeah. feel not heard in your marriage I'm very sensitive it's going to that. bring up that childhood trauma the 13-year-old Sida who yeah. doesn't feel heard is exactly. going to be experiencing that as the 33-year-old Sida in a marriage Right exactly he does and know so you. I He's know just... that was fantastic that was therapeutic in itself Okay Thanks, give me $250 <laughs> But, you know, so we went through this uh, weekend long session of with Imago therapy, and that's when we were able to pinpoint how we view our mom and how we view our dad and what we gained from them, what we didn't and how that plays out in our marriage. And I think that was a, a one of those aha moments of like, oh, the problem is not Kelsey. <laughs> you know, Kelsey is triggering all, triggering all these things that I'm supposed to mature from. 
So how do I mature from that? How do I work through this? And he is the best person to take me through that. Um, although it's painful, although, you know, it's re-traumatizing. But this other therapist said that, you know, she, she described to Kelsey because I, I felt like my pain wasn't being heard. And, you know, and he just kept poking at my pain. And the therapist said, you know, Kelsey, imagine Saito with this huge like sore on her leg and just the the air alone hurts that wound and your job is not to do anything but to protect it and so that it can heal on its own and so yeah, I you didn't know, like that therapist. You didn't, <laughs> you didn't like that therapist, but that brought a lot of like, oh, yeah, Kelsey, yeah, yeah. that's your role. Your role is not to pick at what I'm saying. It's not to solve it. It's not to you know take it apart. It's not to you know bring attention to it. It's to let me deal with what I need to deal with. But I need you there to help protect it and and just be there with me in the presence. Yeah, I had to stop going to her, man. <laughs> Take, <it. laughs> Take this back, I'm man. Not, I'm not reopening any old yeah, wounds no. in this no, interview, no, am I? No, I you're taking show. me back. You, can, you know what the bottom line is? that We had to go through all that. Even when it, we start that same muscle that I went through on, on the year of patience, I use now in running a business. And I'm so grateful for that. The empathy, the ability to see outside of yourself, to calm down, to not lose your temper it's so many of those things come from the same place yeah. as an entrepreneur and people young people working for you as a parent right. like wow that's a, i'm a beast now because of that, yeah. that pain and isn't it funny that so many of the, our greatest tests we look back and even though we went in excruciating pain, we're so grateful for them. Yeah, yeah. And for me, I found my voice, you know, just trying to figure out what is it that I'm feeling because I know it's valid. How do I articulate that? How do I articulate it in a way that he can understand? And then how can we both work together to get to a, a point where we're both happy? So that was a lot of work. And I'm seeing, you know, when I talk to my friends, when I talk to other people, I'm able to articulate now what steps they can go through to get to this place of, of, of unity. Um, you know, and, and so through all that, I found my voice. You know, now I'm asking, now people are asking me to be keynote speakers. You know, that's something new in, in my life. But I, I wouldn't be able to be articulate if it were not for Kelsey. I would not know myself if it were not for Kelsey. You should end on that right there, man. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Well, um, any any thoughts on through these marital struggles that you've had and, um, and now you kind of help counsel younger couples and talk to them as well, like any thoughts from the writings about, um, about marriage and uh, what are spiritual tools that you use for me, justice, um, I, I can't think of any specific quotes about marriage right now other than, you know, marriage is a fortress for well-being. Um, and, and, and when I think of that phrase in itself, marriage is where, where you are supposed to gain strength. That is where you're supposed to be, you know, getting healthy and stronger to deal with the outside world. And what was happening in our marriage early on, I was creating all these other places where I gained strength to deal with my marriage. So I would be at work, you know, and, and, and my friends would help me be strong there. I would go to dance and dance salsa and my friends there would help me be strong so that I can manage my marriage. And it should be the opposite. My marriage should be where I feel whole and complete and if you're not feeling that way, how do you get to that point? You know, I mean, we still have a lot of work. I know, you know, 20 years from now, we're still going to, we're going to be like, wow, we knew nothing in our 20 years <laughs> in of 2018, May, in yeah. 2018, you know, so we still have a long way to go. But looking back, it's like, oh my gosh, we, we really turned this around and we were creating a fortress where the both of us can benefit, where we can help each other be the best version of ourselves um, and, and motivate and encourage instead of you know it, us competing with one another and us you know arguing all the time and 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 kind of debasing and 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 you know just having this negative lens with each other it, you have to go through that work um 
I don't think I answered your question. I don't know. <laughs> but that's good. It's yeah. good stuff. Purpose. I think it comes back to purpose. When when you realize it, that uh, you're here for a purpose, then the difficulties of marriage can make sense in their context. Like, why am I having such difficult time in this marriage? Then knowing that through tests you grow and marriage is like the crucible of tests. They're the ultimate test. It, I think is important too because we get this counter message that we get married to have a great life and it should be happily ever after and the romance of it all. It's almost a very selfish thing. Yeah. But in reality, if we remember like the, the noonday prayer tell, you know, Baha'is have to say this prayer every day to remind us of our purpose. And You know, uh, M. Scott Peck, who wrote The Road Less Traveled, which is a great uh, book and very Baha'i in its spirit, he has this great quote about marriage. He says, love is the will to extend oneself for the purpose of nurturing one's own or another's spiritual growth. Mm. Yeah. So extending oneself for nurturing another's spiritual Amen. growth um, is, yeah. uh, is a, really, a really beautiful thought. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for coming over to my Chicago apartment. And it's been <laughs> such a pleasure hanging out with you guys here uh, in this city. And... Um, Thank you for all of your amazing work, both you guys. We'll, we'll have links below so people can check out other stuff that you guys do and, and get to know you a little bit better. And um, any last yeah, thoughts? No, thank you for all the work that you do in, in providing this uh, for us to share our story. So I'm, I'm super grateful for you, Rain. Thanks, thank Rain. you. Thanks. Bye, guys. Thank you for tuning in. Bye. Thanks for listening to Baha'i Blogcast. Hope you enjoyed the episode and the conversation. Check out more fun Baha'i stuff on Baha'iblog.net. Thank you so much, and good night.